Hello there. Here we are in lesson 40 of our study in the book of Romans. We are in chapter 10, verses 4 to 10. And um, Paul is still um, talking to the Romans regarding the uh, willful rejection of their Savior, of their Messiah, uh, and what the repercussions of that is. Um, they were ignorant. Yes, they were. But they were willfully ignorant. It's not as if they didn't have what it is they needed in order to know the truth. They willfully believed the um, the teachings of the scribes and the um, the rabbis uh, in their interpretation of the scripture, even though they knew the scriptures and they could have told that the the two were not consistent with each other. But they didn't question the scribes and the rabbis. They gave them places of honor and um, ignored the the teaching of the Holy Spirit, the tugging, perhaps, of the Holy Spirit uh, when these teachings were definitely against Scripture. Um, they, uh, they ignored or uh, missed um, the reality of God's uh, holiness and his righteousness and what his expectations of righteousness were on all of mankind, but in particular, the Jews. Uh, Paul tells us in chapter 3 that God had given them, made them, entrusted them with the oracles of God, Romans 3, 2. Um, what had God entrusted them with? He had given his prophets the words of truth for them to utter to the people of Israel. Um, and the, the Israelites, the Jews, just did not take that as being truth. Um, in a lot of cases, they mocked the, 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 uh, the prophets. Uh, in some cases, they killed the prophets because they were uttering words that, um, even though they were from God, they were not the words that tickled their ears, not the words that they wanted to hear. Um, the words that Paul speaks to the Jews could very well be uttered by Paul today to every every culture and every society that has willfully um, that has remained willfully ignorant of the of the person of God and His holiness and His righteousness, uh, choosing instead to establish their own form of righteousness, which sometimes amounts to calling evil good and calling good evil. Um, we're going to begin in verse 4 and spend just a little bit of time on that. Uh, verse 4 of chapter 10, Paul says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. When How do you believe, how do you think that God feels when man substitutes his own idea of righteousness for the righteousness that God has made very plain is his own. I would think that he would be insulted, wouldn't you? Um, certainly, uh, we see Jesus, even in the, his public ministry, we see him uh, be insulted um, on behalf of God the Father. When he goes into the temple and he turns those tables <clears throat> over, um, he is um, seeking, uh, he's, uh, <laughs> what is he doing? He's um, venting his, um, his, his wrath, basically, uh, his anger that his father should be treated such, uh, so disrespectfully in his own house. Um, certainly, um, that is um, probably, I don't think there's probably about it. Uh, we had a short discussion in our live class. We finally were able to meet <laughs> in live session this past Friday. And um, uh, we had a, a discussion on how much more difficult it is for a good person to come to um, recognition that they are sinners, as opposed to a person who will just is more than willing to acknowledge that they are a sinner in need of salvation. A person who looks at their past and they don't see any blatant sin or what they consider to be blatant sin, 
um, and considers themselves to be a good person, then why would they need a savior? A savior from what? <clears throat> um, I've been there. Took me um, took me longer than it took Don to uh, accept the Lord. Not a whole lot longer, but yeah, longer because um, I don't know. I guess I was a sinner, but I really couldn't think of anything that I had done that was that offensive. Um, so it took me a while to acknowledge exactly what sin is and um, uh, in God's eyes, not in my own eyes or in somebody else's eyes, but in God's eyes. Um, it's a failure um, to recognize, uh, not to fail to recognize who God is um, and who we are in comparison to him. He is all holy, all good, all perfect, uh, all righteous, and we are not. <clears throat> we don't even come close when we come right down to it, and we never will. <laughs> um, Paul is well aware of this dilemma. Um, he was at, considered at one time to be the perfect Jewish man. Uh, he tells us, and we looked at this a little bit <clears throat> uh, on Friday, that um, when he tells you exactly what he was, I was the Pharisee of Pharisees, the Jew of Jew, the Hebrew of Hebrews. Um, I was out to to uh, in vengeance to 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 tear down those people of the way who um, who said that this guy Jesus was the uh, was the Messiah. I, I was out to help God with a vengeance. Uh, he knows what it is to have a person be prideful in their own accomplishments and in their own righteousness as opposed to the righteousness that God demands. He was well familiar with that, um, that dilemma. Uh, what is that sin? That's a sin of pride. When we say, when we can say, well, I don't sin. Uh, either I never sinned or I don't sin or I don't sin as much as I used to. Um, then, um, that's a sin of pride. We can uh, be as thankful as Paul was that God knows our heart and forgives our ignorance. And the only reason he forgives our ignorance is because he knows our heart, that we are not being willfully ignorant, but uh, our heart is in the right place. Certainly, that was where Paul was. And um, we can be thankful that um, he knows that about us too. Verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments uh, shall live by them. If we were dependent on perfect obedience to the law in order to be saved, then how many would actually be saved? We're not even talking about the 613 or 630, however many <clears throat> laws there are that the Jews added <clears throat> to God's original laws. Just take the Ten Commandments and I'll ask the question again. How many, what percentage of humankind do you believe are in perfect obedience to the Ten Commandments? Um, I think it's a big round number of zero. <laughs> zero percent. Uh, none. Not one single solitary one can obey every single, is always in perfect obedience to the Ten Commandments. And if a person does claim to be in perfect obedience always and forever to the Ten Commandments, then he is definitely guilty of the sin of pride. Um, God demands absolute righteousness, 100% righteousness. James, in a, a chapter 2 of the book of James, verse 10, says this, For whosoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it. Um, no, we would have to obey all of the law, all of the time, forever and ever until, until we take our last breath. And no one can do that or ever has. Um, there is no way that any one can establish absolute right, absolute righteousness. It is only through the perfect righteousness of Jesus that we have any any kind of hope. And uh, 
in, in essence, what Paul is saying is, if you want to be judged by the law, then so be it. How's that working out for you? <laughs> um, yeah, if Paul was talking to us today, that's probably exactly what he would say. All right. If that's the standard that you want to uh, lay down for yourself, then uh, let's see how far that gets you. It won't get you very far. Verse six, but the righteousness based on faith, as opposed to the righteousness based on the law, <laughs> um, says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Kind of a curious, kind of a curious verse, don't you think? What is Paul talking about here? The commandments uh, of the Old Testament um, did not call for external obedience to them. Why did God give the Israelites who had just been rescued out of the hands of the Egyptians, why did he give them the Ten Commandments? Saying, I want you to do this, and I want you to do this, and I don't want you to do this, and I don't want you. No, that wasn't the purpose at all. It was so in their efforts to obey these commandments, the Jews would understand that there was no way that they could ever even hope to obey just those Ten Commandments, that something else needed to be provided for them because obeying the commandments was not going to cut it. Um, they are a call to heartfelt, adoring faith in God, um, to the God of mercy and forgiveness, um, who graciously forgives the sinner. Um, they do seem kind of odd, but all, all, he's all he's talking about here is, where are you looking for God? Are you looking for him in these mystical, esoteric journeys? We see a lot of that today, all of the mystical, spiritual uh, efforts of people to find God in odd places. Um, God's not in odd places. Uh, that's not where we have to go to find him. We don't have to delve deep into the scriptures and convert numbers um, into um, prophecies and make things much more compl complex than what God ever intended that they would be. God knows our minds. <laughs> he knows we're simple. He made it as simple as he could when you come right down to it. Verse 8, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Uh, to say it another way, well, Jesus said it another way. I I am standing on the other side of the door. All you have to do is knock and I will open the door and let you in. That was my paraphrase of Jesus' words. Um, actually, what Jesus says is he stands at the door and knocks and we need to let him in. That is what he says. It kind of works both ways. It must be a swinging door. Um, <laughs> I'll have to give that a little bit of thought. But God does not hide from us. He does not make himself difficult for us to find. Um, just go outside on a beautiful fall day, which it is now, um, and look at the beauty of God's creation. Uh, that is God revealed. That is God revealing himself um, in waterfalls and flowers and um, just all the amazing uh, things of nature that we uh, see and experience. That is the revelation of God. He's not hiding. Um, he is revealing himself to us. And he will. He would never hide, especially from someone who seeks him. Um, no, he would never hide from someone who seeks him. Verse 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Ah, that is the criteria for being saved. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, 
then you will be saved. Two criteria listed here. Uh, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Um, which one comes first? The faith comes first, doesn't it? It says confess from your mouth, but what is the criteria? What are you confessing? You're confessing that which is in your heart, your faith. Um, faith comes first. The confession follows. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. There, Paul says it right there. With the heart, that is where what we believe resides. <clears throat> and that is what justifies us. Um, with the mouth, one, confess, one confesses that which is in our heart, and we are saved. But words are cheap. Words are cheap. Um, we, can, we can say a lot of words and still not be saved if what is in our heart is not true. Um, here's a question for you. Um, by which are we saved? By our faith or by our confession? <clears throat> Before you answer, <laughs> we're going to go back to James for a minute. Chapter 2, verse 9. Here's what James says. You believe that God is done. If you believe that God is one. Uh, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Um, oh, dear. <laughs> even the demons believe and shudder. Uh, they even spoke the confession. We see a couple of examples of demons that Jesus approached and they acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, don't they? That's a confession, isn't it? If you address Jesus as the Son of God, then that is a confession that you recognize that he is the Son of God. And who are we talking about here? We're talking about demons, the devil, Satan, Satan's, Satan's uh, minions. Um, de demon <laughs> demons are perfectly orthodox in their theology, perfectly orthodox in their theology, they acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, not their Lord, but creator of the universe. How do they know he was creator of the universe? Because the scripture tells us that the angels were witnesses. The angels were witnesses to God's creation of the earth. So they know he's the creator. <laughs> they were right there when he was speaking the universe into existence by the power of his word. Um, demons know what heaven is like. How do they know what heaven is like? That's where they came from. That's where they fell out of. Um, they know that because uh, they know that, that they're judged. Why? Because God said they are. Do they believe? God when he says that they're judged? I don't think they would be shuddering. Um, I don't think that they would be um, calling Jesus off of them if they didn't recognize the fact that they stand judged before God. So what does James say? He says, um, okay, so you say that you um, that God is one. Okay, that's good. But you know what? The demons say that too. <laughs> Um, and when they say it, they shudder. <laughs> Are you shuddering when you recognize who God is? Does it make us shudder? Um, not if we received him as he wants to be received, as our savior, as our father, as our friend. Um, how do, uh, so what's Paul's point? So what is Paul's point? Just as the demons held a belief that is essentially theologically correct, um, it is possible for a person to hold such a view that is theologically correct and still not receive the Lord as his Savior. Um, it's kind of sad, very sad, actually, not kind of sad, very sad. A, a person can even be well aware of his sin. Um, he can suffer great emotional grief over it. Um, he can long to be uh, delivered from the power of sin over him. But 
if a person doesn't repent of that sin and turn from that sin and turn toward God, then um, God can't forgive him. Uh, God can't remove the sin from him uh, because his heart is still not right with God in spite of the words that he might speak. The writer of Hebrews, I hesitated to even add this passage in here because it is it's a devastating warning. Well, let's go to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6. This is what the, the writer of Hebrews says. <clears throat> For it is possible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Words are cheap. <laughs> we must be continuing in our sanctification. Uh, it must be the desire of our heart to know more and more of our God, to know more and more about Jesus, and to um, uh, to be growing in our relationship with him. That needs to be the desire of our heart, because words, they're cheap. Um, so I ask the question again, uh, by which we are we saved? By our faith? or by our confession, obviously by our faith. The confession's important, but we are saved by the faith, by that which is in our heart. In the book of um, Acts, <clears throat> Jesus is referred um, to as Savior only two times. In the whole book of Acts, Jesus is referred to sa as Savior only twice but he is referred to as Lord 92 times. <laughs> in all of the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as Savior 10 times, and he's referred to as Lord over 700 times. That blows my mind. Only two times as Savior in the book of Acts, 10 times in all the New Testament, over 700 times in the New Testament, as Lord. <clears throat> easy to call him Savior. Not so easy to acknowledge that he is our Lord. We don't make him our Lord. He is our Lord. <laughs> he is our master. We don't uh, make him that. Um, when we talk of Jesus, we call him our Lord and master, our Lord and Savior. Um, in that order, um, <clears throat> to be the second, um, he must be the first. In order to be our Savior, he must be our Lord. And we must be his bond servant, um, a, um, a servant that is uh, willingly gives himself up to the master, to, the, to his Lord. Uh, Christ became uh, incarnate. What's that mean? He became man. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of uh, his mother, who was a virgin. Uh, he experienced every kind of temptation, yet lived his earthly life 100% sinless. Um, he, um, <clears throat> he died. He was uh, buried. He uh, was resurrected from the dead after having been dead for three days. Uh, he was resurrected from the dead. He was not restored to life like Lazarus was. Lazarus was restored to life. He was not resurrected. Jesus was resurrected. He was not restored to life. When Jesus visited with his apostles and with the women um, at the tomb, uh, he was in his resur He had his resurrection body, uh, not his in his incarnate body his resurrected body. Um, the same power that conceived him in Mary's womb is the same power that 
resurrected him from the earthly grave. <clears throat> Just um, end with this statement. And because of God the Father's willingness to give his son on behalf of mankind, and because of God the Son's willingness to do the will of his Father, uh, we can enjoy the full ministry of God the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and we can have the assurance of eternal life with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit for eternity. Amen? A little bit louder. Amen. Amen.